In this episode, we listen to Jack Drescher on his paper titled Attending to Sexual Compulsivity in a Gay Man. With uh, his words, we can conceive how themes of hiding abound in the developmental narratives of boys who grow up to be gay. Their need to hide is reinforced by the traumatizing public humiliations that ensues from either open expressions of uh, same-sex desire or gender non-conforming behavior. When open expressions of same-sex intimacy are driven underground, clandestine and forbidden sexual activities, highly tinged with interpersonal anxiety, may become a significant mode of relatedness. Jack Drescher is a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in private practice in New York City, a clinical professor of psychiatry at Columbia University and a faculty member of their psychoanalytic program and their division of gender, sexuality and health. He is an adjunct professor at the New York University postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis and a training and supervising analyst at the William Allenson White Institute. He also serves as a consultant to IPA's Committee on Gender and Sexual Diversity. This is Gaetano Pellegrini with Talks on Psychoanalysis, the IPA podcast devoted to topics published in the IPA Society Journals and Congress Debates Worldwide, featuring the voices of the original authors. To stay informed about the latest podcast releases, please sign up today. In this podcast, which we are calling Attending to Sexual Compulsivity in a Gay Man, I will be discussing a psychoanalytic approach for understanding sexually compulsive gay men that distinguishes the problem of their being sexually compulsive From the, from the issue of their sexual identity. I will offer Harry Stack Sullivan's conceptualization of dissociative defenses as a useful way to understand and therapeutically work with gay men in general and with sexually compulsive gay men in particular. This is a psychoanalytic approach that allows the sexual identities of gay men to be respected while addressing the compulsive behaviors that some of them may find so troubling. So I'll begin by talking about themes of hiding, which are common in the developmental narratives of boys who grow up to be gay. Their need to hide is reinforced by the traumatizing public humiliation that happens from showing any open expressions of same-sex desire or any gender non-conforming behavior. The experience of these boys of being discovered, punished, and humiliated for showing or acting on such feelings or behaviors can lead to hiding activities that continue long after the actual trauma is forgotten. And there are many memoirs and biographies that offer illustrations of this phenomenon. For example, the late Derek Jarman was a gay filmmaker who described such a moment at his English boarding school. And he wrote, quote, At the age of nine, I was caught in bed with Gavin, thrown onto the floor by the headmaster's wife, lectured publicly and whipped. Frightened by this unexpected outburst, I was to have no physical contact for 13 years. I lived my adolescence so demoralized, I became reclusive. I was desperate to avoid being the sissy of my father's criticism, terrified of being the queer in the dormitory. My work also suffered. I dropped behind. At puberty, my report said, more concentration needed. You see, I was distracted, end of quote. In a culture that claims to value the linkage of sex with emotional intimacy, it is difficult to foster those connections in gay teenagers in the same way they are encouraged in heterosexual adolescents. And it would be an understatement to say that adult support for adolescent gay dating is not common. Although there are some socially progressive enclaves where that may not be the case. But how many parents would consider sanctioning a gay teenager's search for physical or emotional intimacy with another boy? Some boys who grew up to be gay, like Jarman, refrain from sexual activity and avoid emotional intimacy during important developmental years. Others seek and find outlets for their sexual and emotional needs in secretive encounters. 
And for some adults, these activities can become a way of life. One gay writer, John Retchie, idealized what he called the sex hunt in his book called The Sexual Outlaw. He wrote, and I'll quote, the promiscuous homosexual is a sexual revolutionary. Each moment of his outlaw existence, he confronts repressive laws, repressive morality. Parks, alleys, subways, tunnels, garages, streets, these are his battlefields. To the sex hunt, he brings a sense of choreography, ritual, and mystery. Sex cruising with an electrified instinct that sends and receives messages of an orgy at any moment, any place. What creates the sexual outlaw, Reggie asks? Rage. End of quote. Now, Reggie calls cruising areas, that is, the kinds of places, indoors and outdoors, where gay men go to meet each other for sex, he calls them battlefields. However, from his perspective, the battle might be thought of as guerrilla warfare, because the larger problem of heterosexism is too large a target to take down directly. For example, consi for example consider the unlikely possibility of gay men demonstrating the degree of physical activity one routinely sees by, uh, in heterosexual couples on a beautiful day in Central Park here in New York City, or in any large park in your own hometown. Even today, there are many neighborhoods in cosmopolitan and liberal New York City where two men holding hands can still raise a few eyebrows. And in some parts of the city, it may even lead to the raising of arms and violence. When open expressions of same-sex intimacy are driven underground, secretive and forbidden sexual activities highly tinged with interpersonal anxiety may become a significant mode of relatedness. For gay men like Retchie, this is a triumphant act of will and not a psychiatric problem. Others, however, can experience their sexuality as a compelling force and feel troubled by it. Now, historically, classical psychoanalytic practitioners theorized that compulsive sexual behavior in their gay, gay male patients was evidence of the neurotic origins of homosexuality. And their formulations conflated the treatment of compulsive sexuality with so-called cures of homosexuality, what are today called conversion therapies. However, other clinical experiences show that gay men who experience their sexual activities as compulsive do not necessarily experience their sexual attractions as compulsive. Nevertheless, because of the unsavory nature of the places in which they feel compelled to express their sexuality, these men may feel intense shame about being gay. Which brings us to the subject of dissociation. It's important to emphasize at the outset that a gay sexual identity is not definitive of any defensive style. There is no homosexual personality. So focusing on the way gay men dissociate should not obscure the fact that they are a heterogeneous group. Denial, intellectualization, rationalization, and other defenses are as likely to be found in gay men as they are in other patients. That being said, however, many gay men have a history of being subjected to events, traumatic or otherwise, that exaggerated the normal tendency to screen anxiety-provoking and shameful memories. From an early age, the social stigma surrounding homosexuality led many gay people to hide knowledge about their sexuality, not only from others, but from themselves as well. In other words, anti-homosexual cultural prejudices reinforce dissociative activities, which makes Harry Stack Sullivan's conceptualization of dissociative defenses useful in clinically understanding and therapeutically working with gay men in general and with sexually compulsive gay men in particular. Parenthetically, Sullivan was himself a closeted gay man, although it's not clear how central his sexual identity was to his theory of dissociation. Now, Sullivan regarded dissociation as an interpersonal process, one that was accessible to observation. In his two-person psychoanalytic model, a therapist notes gaps as a patient avoids certain subjects and topics. It was Sullivan's belief that this avoidance, or selective inattention, as he called it, was deliberate, although the patient's motive to avoid may be out of conscious awareness. And many gay men report having a sense of their same-sex feelings years before openly acknowledging them. They learn to dissociate knowledge about their sexuality and also have to prevent other people from being able to recognize the quality of their sexual feelings or desires. 
This state of mind is commonly captured in the experience of gay men who retrospectively report they always knew they were gay, but they didn't want to admit it to themselves. In Sullivan's view, there is no self without another. So hiding from the self also requires hiding from others. And this is often seen when an adult gay man, despite his advanced stage, is still living with his mother. And it is not unusual for the two of them to develop a kind of don't ask, don't tell relationship, which can lead to the following kind of dissociative enactment. The mother continues to give her son telephone numbers of women he might date which he accepts as if he were going to call them. In accepting the names, the son can maintain the illusion that his mother believes he's a heterosexual bachelor, while he ignores all the nonverbal ways in which she communicates her fuller knowledge of him. A kind of homeostasis can be achieved in which a mother and a son can mutually avoid the anxiety of seeing each other more fully. This type of selective inattention surrounding homosexuality is actually rather commonplace. But more severe dissociative operations are illustrated by reports of sexual encounters that take place under the guise of being asleep. In his book, Clinical Studies in Psychiatry, Sullivan himself provided a dramatic example of this behavior when he describes two male house guests sharing a bedroom in their host's home. Sullivan goes on to describe what happens. This is a quote. During the night, Mr. A gets out from under his cotton sheet and goes around and tenderly fondles Mr. X, and then goes back to bed under his bottom sheet. The following morning, Mr. A, that is the fondler, in Sullivan's words, quote, feels fine and has no trace of any information about what has happened. In other words, it's a kind of sleepwalking. In the interpersonal perspective, anxiety is thought to be triggered when knowledge of the self appears to jeopardize an individual's relationship to others. And given the stigma attached to homosexuality, effeminacy, and promiscuity, it is not just the gay man who may feel anxious about the impact of homosexuality upon his relationships. Many psychoanalysts are made anxious by the subject as well. Freud, in one of his 1912 technical papers, urged what he called a position of neutrality. And in his words, quote, I cannot advise my colleagues, colleagues too urgently to model themselves during psychoanalytic treatment on the surgeon who puts aside all his feelings, even his human sympathy, and concentrates his mental forces on the single aim of performing the operation as skillfully as possible, end quote. But as admirable as Freud's admonition may be, psychoanalytic neutrality is not possible. One only has to study the history of psychoanalysis itself, a field which expresses its own anxiety about homosexuality by integrating cultural prejudices into its theories and practices and by infantilizing and pathologizing gay and lesbian identities. A related expression of psychoanalytic anxiety about the human sexual, sexual diversity can be found in the counter-transferential idealization of monogamy. This type of anxiety is commonly expressed by pejoratively labeling a patient's non-monogamous sexual behaviors as compulsions, acting out, or resistance. It is not altogether surprising that many published psychoanalytic case reports trumpet the treatment success by announcing that the patient got married or settled into a monogamous relationship. This is not neutrality. Unfortunately, from an analytic perspective, Privileging a patient's wish for conventional monogamous relationships over his or her other feelings and activities can interfere with the therapist's ability to empathize with the non-conforming aspects of the patient. Simply treating a sexual compulsion as a symptom can serve the purpose of psychologically distancing oneself from it. In some cases, pathologizing behavior may reflect the counter-transferential judgment of the behavior. And this kind of counter-transference can be a significant obstacle to empathically entering into the subjectivity of the patient. Therefore, I'd like to conclude by recommending that whenever a patient invites a therapist to play the part of babysitter or moral guardian, whether directly or implicitly, through the kinds of questions get, that get asked or don't get asked, it is preferable to avoid being drawn into that enactment. Although it may be no easy task, 
Therapists should make every effort to accept both the patient's desire for unconventional sexual excitement, as well as the longing for a more conventional relationship. At the same time, therapists should also be skeptical about the patient's desire for conventional relationships and the patient's characterizing of their sexuality as compulsive. An idealized but impossible to attain neutrality will not get therapists through these inevitably tough moments when they feel counter-transferentially judgmental of their patients. But respect for difference, on the other hand, just might do the trick.